Welcome to our Portions Podcast, where we discuss the portions of Scripture that are being read in the synagogues around the world each and every week. The goal and desire of these podcasts are that you would not only learn and be encouraged by the Scripture, but also that your heart would be enlarged where Israel and the Jewish people are concerned. So I ask you to open your Bible and open your heart, and I pray that over the course of the next 20 minutes, that the God of Israel would meet us as we study His Word together. Thank you so much for joining us for another TFI Portions podcast. Nick Lesmeister with us for this podcast. Nick, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your crazy schedule to be with us for our Portions podcast. Uh, It's my pleasure, Scott. I'm excited to do this. I think what you're doing with this is really awesome. So it's an honor for me to be a part of it and to uh, connect with you to talk about some of the great things that we're finding in some of these wonderful scriptures. Yeah, it's so amazing. You know, as, as, as Jewish people around the world this week are going to be delving in to these scriptures, I just think that there's so much to be, uh, to be gleaned from what the Lord is doing. And as, and as we read these, friends, I really want to encourage you as we do these portions podcasts that this is not only a time that we're able to delve into the scriptures, but it's also a time where we can really relate more closely with what Jewish people around the world are looking at. And it, it, it's going to help us in our prayers and our identification where Israel is concerned. So let's just jump right in. Nick, why don't you give us the title of this particular portion? It's Genesis 18, 1 through 20, 23. But there's a Hebrew word that's associated with this particular portion. And what's that Hebrew word? Yeah, it's Yitro, Y-I-T-R-O, which is the Hebrew word for Jethro, who is Moses' father-in-law, as we read in the Scripture. And, you know, what's funny about this, Scott, is that this is probably, you know, in the top five of all Torah portions as it relates to the centrality of the defining, you know, nature of the Jewish people and of Israel, because, uh, as we know, this, you know, in Exodus 1920, God, you know, calls the Jewish people into this kingdom of priests and, uh, uh, you know, holy nation through giving them the law through the Ten Commandments. So that's a pretty powerful, action-packed a couple of chapters here, but the fact that it's titled and called by uh, the name of Moses' father-in-law is very interesting, and uh, I yeah. think, you know, from what I wrote in the in the portion on the blog, we see that it's even more interesting that... <laughs> Hear this man, you know who who's a Midianite priest. So that's you know, that's for, he, well, he's certainly not a Christian. Let's start no, there. <laughs> he's not at all. Not it a, is a, so so he gets the title, you know, for really one of the most powerful, uh, you know, uh, elements of Torah portions in Israel's history. It's 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 crazy. And obviously, I was being a little bit facetious when I said he wasn't a Christian. There's no such thing as Christianity, but he certainly wasn't a fearer of the God. Of Israel, which blows me away. He was basically an idol worshiper, correct? Yeah, no, it was. I mean, that's what it says that he was a priest of Midian, and uh, right there in the first the first verse of chapter eighteen, and um, you know, so Moses married into this family, who obviously his wife Zipporah was a Midianite as well. Yeah, and um, you know, and, and the Midianites really are you know an Arab people, and so that's a whole other element there that we probably don't have time to get into. <laughs> right. You know. Where you right. see this Jew and Arab expression, you know, even related all the way back into Exodus 18. But yeah, he was a he was a uh, worshiper of false gods. So he's and a, not just that, but he was a priest. He was a priest, a worshiper of false gods, and he's actually. It looks like he's bringing Moses' wife back to Moses. And I'm not. We're not going to get into all of that. But yeah. when when he brings his wife back to Moses, uh, it's really really remarkable because here this for lack of a better better term, unsaved or, or uh, idol-worshiping guy is showing up. And then something remarkable happens, and you, you actually wrote about it in the blog, but Moses recounts the story of Israel's redemption and basically salvation, mm-hmm. and Jethro responds in a crazy way. Just talk about that for a minute. Yeah, so what you see, starting in verse 7, that, you know, there's a couple of things that jump out at you when you read this. The first is that 
again, I think we set the context that Jethro is coming as a Midianite priest, so he's he's someone from the nations, you know, and he's not worshiping the God of Israel. Right. And uh, and you know, we know at this point, it, you know, Israel was just delivered out of Egypt, who was very much a pagan land, and so we, you know, you kind of put yourself in the shoes even of the Israelite people at the time, and maybe even Moses as the leader, and think, wow, you know, God just delivered us from these pagan people who were oppressing us. And now you see Jethro, his father-in-law, um, you know, a priest, uh, you know, to pagan gods, and he comes out, and the first thing I notice is that it says that Moses bows low respectfully and greets him warmly. So it's almost, wow. you know, it's amazing that Moses even comes with humility to his father-in-law yes. and, and submits himself, you know? And then, yeah, so they they ask each, you know, they kind of catch up and do small talk, and then Moses invites him, he invites Jethro um, into his tent to tell him everything that the Lord had done to rescue Israel from Pharaoh and the Egyptians. And um, and and, and then in verse 9 it says that Jethro was delighted when he heard about all that the Lord had done for Israel uh, as he brought them out of Egypt. And the interesting thing when you look at that, and, and I wrote about this, is that that word, delighted, uh, or happy or joyous, however, whatever you know, Bible translation you're using. I'm reading this out of the New Living Translation. Yeah. The Hebrew word for that is vayichad, and vayichad is is a word that most you know literally translates into joyous. But when you study this, um, and this is what I love what you said earlier about about thinking about what the Jewish people are thinking about, getting us as believers and followers of Yeshua. You know, into that cycle of what are what's going on in the Jewish community as this portion is being read. Well, yeah. you, when you study into it, rabbis over the century notice that that word is derived. It, it, it derives from a word that essentially means goosebumps or like a chill. <laughs> and so you get this picture that Jethro all of a sudden says Jethro was delighted when he heard about all the Lord had done for Israel as he brought them out of Egypt. But if you think about it differently and you put it in the context of him not being a member. Of, of the people of Israel, and being somebody who worshiped false gods, I mean, he has a lot in common with the Egyptians, Yeah, you know? And so, really, it's almost like the Scripture is saying Jethro, Jethro got chills when yeah. he heard about what God did for Israel, but also what happened to Egypt. And, and so, you start to see this, I think, you know, sympathetic side of Jethro, and you, you peer into his humanity and think, wow, that's pretty amazing that God did all this for Israel, but boy, at the same time, he absolutely wiped Egypt out. Wow. And I'm someone who doesn't worship the God of Israel. I'm a Midianite priest. And, uh, and so basically, he, you know, Jethro is so moved by all of this that, <laughs> you know, he essentially becomes a follower of the God of Israel, and he, and he gives up his, you know, his, his uh, pagan worship, and it says that Moses and Aaron you know, offer a sacrifice to the Lord with Jethro, and, you know, he becomes, uh, it's, you know, a new follower of, of the one true God. <laughs> that, that, that's just remarkable. I'd, I'd like to hone in on this just for a, a minute longer. Um, you know, in verse 11, Jethro says, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. It's, it's like, now I know... You know, it's it's some of us who are listening today, um, maybe going through a significant trial, and we've got family. I've got family members that are not believers in Yeshua, yeah. and um, it's remarkable to me that sometimes you can open up you can open up the Bible and try to convince people through Scripture. Mm-hmm. That, that Yeshua is king, that Yeshua mm-hmm. is the promised Messiah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But what's remarkable to me about this is that the thing that brought salvation to Jethro was not any kind of proof that Moses gave through the validity of scriptures, which obviously wasn't even yet written, but yeah. through the validity of God moving in the midst of impossible situations mm-hmm. in Moses' life and in the life of the children of Israel. You know, sometimes I think that people say, oh, you know, I'm a believer, you know, in the God of Israel, therefore I'm not going to go through trials and I'm, you know, I'm the head and not the tail and I'm, we've got victory. And although those things are true, when you look at something like this and see that salvation came to a family member, not because he was convinced through the oracles of somebody, but rather through God working in the midst of difficult situations. That is so amazing, bro. It really is. I, I, you know, you're, we're reminded of that, you know, scripture, 
you know, in Revelation, it says very much the same thing, that, you know, we overcome by the, yes. the uh, blood of the Lamb and the power of our testimony. Yeah. And you're right that, that, that this especially, you know, again, you put Jethro in his context, and as a Midianite priest, he's a very learned man, and he's a very mature, wise man. He knew very well about the kingdom in Egypt. He knew very well how strong they were, how much of a superpower they were. Yeah. And then I'm sure he's kind of, you know, he comes out to the camp to meet Moses. This is just my imagination kind of recreating this. Yeah. And he sees these, you know, 600,000 to a million ragtag people who have been drugged through a desert and, you know, escaped through, you know, a, 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 you know, a dry a seabed. And he's got to be thinking, wait, y'all brought them down? <laughs> Am, what? You know, and it's it's kind of like that moment. I, I love how you relate it to the personal, Scott, because I think this is the power for us to remember as believers that what God does in our lives, sometimes it can be easy for us to minimize that. Right. You know, and I think over time, because we're dealing with our own sin, we're dealing with our own struggles. But when God delivers us from something, we really don't know just how big of a testimony that's going to be to the person down the street, yes. to a family member, to a long friend of ours. You know, and I think especially as it relates to the Jewish people, when the God of Israel works in your life, either as a Gentile or a Jewish follower of Yeshua, man, that is a huge testimony because you can't you can't unprove it. Right. You know, right. I mean, it happened. You know, if I, you know, if if He sets me free from some kind of bondage or addiction, and I, you know, put it on display, I mean. It's just like Jethro saw here. That person looks at me and says, well, I know what you used to be like, and I know what you are now, and there's really no other way to explain that other than there must be a God in heaven, you know? Yeah. It's so so remarkable. As you're talking, I I was flipping over to Acts chapter 16 because here you've got Paul and Silas in prison. It's midnight. They've just been beaten. Everything. It's like, why in the world? They were obeying what God told them to do. And then they get thrown into prison, but the results of their trial ended up being not only that they were released, but all the prisoners were listening to them. All the doors were opened in that prison. Everyone's chains were unfastened and the, 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 uh, the jailer and his whole household encountered God. It's like when we can have that eternal perspective, that our current trials are not God uh, penalizing us, but mm-hmm. rather putting us in a situation for many to see and many to fear and many to put their trust in the Lord. It kind of gives us this uh, <laughs> this ability in the midst of our difficult time to say, okay, Lord, you be glorified. You know that scripture, I think it's Psalm 40. David is in this horrible, horrible pit. You know, it, it, and, and, and he says, I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard my cry. He took mm. me out of the pit of destruction. Yeah. It, and, and I think the Hebrew there, it's like this tumultuous pit, like the water is rising. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's nowhere to go. You know, the water's almost up to our nose. And then God rescues him. Mm-hmm. And, and then the word says, many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. It just goes yeah. back to what you wrote in the blog, what you're talking about now, bro, that um, that God desires to be glorified. And actually, if you don't mind me regressing just a little bit in Exodus 14, which is just the mm-hmm. Parsha before, it God says to Moses that he will be honored and glorified through Pharaoh, mm-hmm. wh- which is really, really interesting that the thing that we think is keeping Israel from its destiny is going to be the very thing that God is glorified in. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's a remarkable thing. No, it's true. And I, I think that, that you, you know, these are these wonderful little instances, particularly, you know, in the Torah, the first five books, where you begin seeing this real care that God has for the nations, mm. you know. And, and I, think, I think I can speak to this very personally, being a Gentile and growing up in the Christian church, um, and some deep streams of the Christian Church, you know, uh, it, it's easy for for me, I think, to come with a context to say, well, those first five books of the Bible, you know, this is Israel's history. There's so much detail in there about Israel, and when you start to go through and you look and you see these examples of of like Jethro, you know, you see, you know, what there is a pattern here that God uses. The particular, which in this case is Israel, and he gets very particular with Israel, as we know. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. in, the, in the coming, uh, that's why I chose this Torah portion because you and I don't have to sit here and talk about all of the uh, Levitical, <laughs> you know, laws. 
And yeah. so, but he gets very particular with the, with with the Jewish people, with the people of Israel. But his desire is always for the universal. It's always yeah. for the nations. And and I, you know, I think I I love when that comes out that you see these little, you know, twinklings of while God's heart has always been for the nations. But he has it. a plan. He has an order on how he wants to do it. And you see that detailed so clearly. And I think, like you said, Scott, one of the things I learned when I got my master's degree. <clears throat> At Hebrew University in Jerusalem, you know, had obviously all my professors were Jewish, um, some of them Orthodox Jews, and one of them, I think it was an Orthodox Jew, um, he he gave me one piece of advice that has always stuck with me, and he said that process determines product. Wow. Process determines product. Yeah. You know, and I think in our world today, particularly, we can just get so belabored over getting to the end. You know. What's the finished product? You know, we all want to talk in our strategy session. What's your vision? What's your goal? You know, where are you going? <laughs> and so often we overlook that, you know what? I think God's actually more interested in the process because in the process is when, as you mentioned earlier, we go through these times of hardships. We go through things that we didn't expect, but they build character in us and they position us to be tools in God's hands. And we just never know. I mean, ultimately, the product is up to God, yeah, you know? Yeah. And as we submit to him in the process, you see that with Israel's history, the, yeah. the process of coming out of Egypt, the process of giving the law. It was all so that God could reach the nation. So, that, so incredible. You know, we could be here, you know, in 2019 following him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really incredible. I love that insight, Nick. And, and, and the remarkable thing is, that God's heart is for the nations. There is a there is an order. It's like it's to the Jew first and also mm-hmm. to the nations. That's Romans 1.16. But now then the nations are responsible now <laughs> to yeah. being a light to Israel and to provoking Israel to jealousy. And isn't it amazing that here this dude Jethro, the former idol worshiper, gets saved. And now he, a man from the nations, is going to be used to yeah. give Israel wisdom. Why don't you talk about that just for a minute? Yeah, well, that's the other kind of, you know, uh, you know, confusing, but in a good way, kind of confounding thing that you see happen here is that yeah. um, most of the time when, you know, and I mentioned earlier coming from a very Christian, you know, church perspective for me, you know, when you study Exodus 18, you know, if you Google Exodus 18 sermon, you are going to get almost 99% of it is going to be topics about leadership, right. about delegation, right. you know, and how Jethro was so wise because he gave Moses this great advice to set up a system of delegated leadership. And yeah. and I think that there's absolute truth in that, and we did see with that that happened. But, you know, you overlook, again, the fact that here's this guy that was just moments earlier, a pagan worshiper, and then he gives Moses advice that doesn't just spin, you know, this isn't just for Moses, mm. you know, and that's what we, I think, have to see in this, that Jethro's advice is so sage, and I think that God used him so much because it wasn't just so that Moses' mental and emotional health could improve so that he didn't have to listen to all these bickering people. Mm. Jethro established a system that brought justice to the fringes of the Israeli camp, yeah. you know, at the time. So if you're, you know, you know, Israel, you know, Israelite 575,961, and you're waiting in line, and you're on Moses' you know, wait list to get justice, Jethro just blew the doors open for you. Yeah. And, and I think it, it just really gives me pause to, to look and see, wow, here's Jethro. He comes on the scene for, think, I think, a grand total of about 17 verses, wow. I think, in all of Scripture. Wow. I, I think if that's right or something like that, you yeah, know. Yeah. Uh, no, 27, okay? It says in verse 27, soon after this, Moses said goodbye to his father-in-law who returned to his own land. And then you don't hear about him anymore. Yeah. And yet he institutes essentially the foundation of the modern, you know, democratic <laughs> court system <laughs> to deliver justice and equality for people. And and I just think it's amazing that God did that, because God, I think, was not just looking at Moses' issue. He was looking at every individual in that mm-hmm. Israeli society. And I think that it goes back to that principle of reaching the universal through the particular. I love and it. And now, you know, it's, just, it's decentralized. He's taking the power away from Moses to be the key judge, and he's giving access for everybody to have a fair judgment that we all now benefit from today. So remarkable, so remarkable, Nick. I can't tell you how deeply I am thankful for our friendship. In in just the last minute or so, why don't you speak to the folks who are listening who may be going through a trial or may think themselves small as or, or insignificant 
as Jethro could have done, comparing himself to these men and women who've been delivered by God and who've been walking with God, and maybe just close us in prayer and and um, and uh, bring this portion to a to a close. Yeah, well, I I, I do think that the the capstone of all this that's so personally inspiring is just to see how God raised this man up. You know, uh, I mean, this is this is God's sovereignty on full display. You know, here He chooses Moses, but then Moses, you know, meets Zipporah who his father is obviously Jethro, you know, from Midian, and um, and he positions him for 27 verses of Scripture, you know, to spin Israel on its head and yeah. to basically establish the foundation of this nation that God's going to use in what he says in, in chapter 19, you know, to be a, a, a holy a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, you yes. know, a, a special treasure. Yes. And I think it's just a reminder to all of us that um, God sees everything. You know, he looks down from heaven and he sees everything. He sees every one of us. He sees what our lives are consumed with. He seems he sees the things we're going through. And um, I think for us, we just have to remember what you were saying earlier, Scott, is that when we respond to him the right way, only God can know how that's going to, to change history, how that's going to affect other people, is that when we can see, wow, you know the God of Israel is a God of great power, of great covenant. Yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna put my faith and trust in Him. Yeah. And then Amen. we just let God take care of the rest, and and the rest of history is in His hands. And uh, but His great care for every person, I think, is so on display in this portion of of uh, the Torah here for this week. Awesome, bro. Why don't you close us in prayer? Yeah. Lord, we're just so grateful for your word. We're yeah. grateful for the fact that these are ancient, ancient scriptures that are still speaking life to us yes. today. And I pray that as those who are listening are reading this Torah portion, as they're considering this uh, particular few uh, chapters of the scriptures, Lord, that I pray that they would see that you are a God of covenant, that you're a God who loves them deeply, who has a plan for each person no matter what that looks like, Lord, we know that you have a plan to bring peace Amen. through the Messiah, to bring hope through the Messiah, and ultimately, Lord, to bring justice through the Messiah as well, Jesus. Yeah. And so we're grateful. Lord, we're so grateful to be grafted into Israel's history, whether Jew or Gentile. Mm -hmm. Lord, to be able to see this has become our history because of Yeshua, and Israel's destiny has become part of our destiny because of Yeshua. And so... Thank you for all of this, Lord, and I pray for every person listening. They would just be encouraged by this uh, portion of Scripture this week to continue to go walking deeper with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Amen. Friends, if you want to know more about um, Nick and the ministry that he oversees, Messianic Jewish Bible Institute, I encourage you to log on to their web website, mjbi.org. There is a whole amount of learning resources on there. You can sign up for their newsletter. They're an incredible organization. And Nick, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for spending this time with us today. It's really been wonderful. Scott, I love any time we get to connect, and, and to connect to talk about the Word of God is even all the more better. So thank you. It's been an honor. Amen. Thanks so much for listening to our podcast today. For more information about Together for Israel and the work that we're doing in the land of Israel, please visit our website at www togetherforisrael.org We look forward to you joining with us next week on another Portions Podcast.